Peter has his uh, reservations about the value of Bitcoin. I additionally have my reservations about the value of gold. One way or another, a lot of talk around blockchain is whether the token should have an intrinsic value and what that value should be. A use case you don't often hear about is the application of technology, in particular blockchain, in the humanitarian world to coordinate the efforts of the various organizations uh, assisting people. And this is what I'm here to talk to you about today. The humanitarian ecosystem, the various organizations you hear of, uh, you know, were not designed at the beginning as part of an elaborate process. They evolved in response to the various needs that arose across the world, conflict, crisis, climate change, so on and so forth. There are many, many organizations. I work for the United Nations World Food Program. Our mission is to end hunger. Within the UN, there's also UNHCR, who looks after the refugees. UNICEF, who looks after children. There are many NGOs, Oxfam, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, the list goes on and on and on. And when something happens, like the war in Ukraine, uh, everyone comes together, everyone is trying to assist the same people, but it's very ad hoc. There is no central registry of people who we want to assist. We often do our own registration, and we all go about uh, assisting in our own siloed way. But what that means is none of us have a good understanding of who's assisting whom with what. And uh, because of that, there is uh, a n really a no good opportunity to coordinate our efforts. And what this can mean is over or under serving. So uh, some, or, you know, some person, I might be registered with one or many organizations and I'll get multiple assistance. And another person uh, might not be uh, registered with as many and getting less assistance, but that doesn't mean I need more or they need less. It's just that there is no visibility and so therefore there is no coordination. Traditionally, uh, Assistance was the form of in-kind. So, for example, the World Food Program brought bags of rice and corn and sorghum and, and gave it to the people who needed that, or units who did protection, or WHO did health. Since 2009 and 10, there has been a shift to so-called uh, from in-kind to cash-based transfers. So instead of me bringing a bank of corn, giving it to someone and say, eat this, I enable them to buy their own food, to make their own purchasing decisions, so perhaps a food voucher. There are a few reasons behind this. Uh, for example, it has an element of dignity. So instead of forcing someone to eat something, they can go and choose what they would like to eat. Uh, it can be more cost effective, so instead of us shipping food from the other side of the world, we can buy it in the local market. And it can also create a multiplier effect in the local economy, which are all good things to have. But it doesn't always work. First, we need to make sure that there is a food market around. So if there's been a massive earthquake or a flood or a war and there's no food market, there's no point giving money. We have to make sure we don't create inflation in the local economy by bringing all of this money. And more importantly, we have to ensure that the food is equally uh, distributed among the family members. So it so happens that when you're giving food food, <laughs> the, the female head of household typically takes charge and she makes sure everyone eats. When you give cash, that may or may not happen. So there are some, let's say, elements to consider there. But this has grown exponentially. In 2009, we, as WFP, did $10 million worth of this sort of cash-based transfers. This year, we've surpassed $2.5 billion. And everyone else in our space is seeing the same, uh, let's say, trajectory. So while before coordination was important, but it was between food and medicine, now it's between cash and cash. So the need for this coordination has grown exponentially. But the issue is that we're all going to the same donors and we're all looking for the same funding. So it's become a sort of a competition of who's the best in cash. And this has led to so-called what I call systems war. So everyone has tried to create the best beneficiary management system, the best transfer system, to show that they can be the best to assist people and therefore get more donor money. So at the exact same time that uh, you're giving the same thing to the same people, the willingness to coordinate that activity has plummeted because, you know, uh, again, you want to be shown as the leader. So um, it's not just 
the technology problem. If we had one simple database, everyone's data was there, everyone would see who's assisting whom with what, would have a solution. But then that database, that system would need an owner. It would need an administrator, typically one of these organizations. And if everyone used one organization system, it would be an admission that this organization is the better one, which is something everyone would like to avoid. So uh, in 2016, I created a project called Building Blocks, which uh, is hoping to overcome some of these challenges through blockchain. So instead of saying that, okay, we have 10 organizations, we have 10 different systems, 10 different individual channels to the people we serve, we first create a blockchain network. Each one of these organizations would operate a validator node. These validator nodes connect together and they create the basic blockchain infrastructure. On top of this network, we would deploy applications or smart contracts, as are they known in the blockchain world. And these could cater to different needs in the humanitarian world. In our case, for example, we created a, so what we call a value transfer application. It's a collection of 12 smart contracts, actually, uh, which does the A to Z from assistance going to a person to that person being able to redeem this assistance. Our wallet itself is a smart contract, and we've designed it in a way that uh, multiple organizations can put assistance into it, but each organization can only spend their own tokens. So WFP and UNICEF can put tokens in the same account. We can see UNICEF's tokens, they can see ours, but we can each only spend our own token. So this way, we're aware of what another organization has put in, and they are aware of what we've put in, so therefore we can coordinate our assistance. We still maintain control over the assistance we're contributing, so we create that visibility that was lacking before. But most importantly, due to the nature of blockchain and especially the way we've designed our project, this is not owned by WFP or UNICEF. It's 100% in every way conceivable, equally owned, equally operated, and an equally governed network that we all contribute towards. And with this, we hope to remove at least the political ownership issue of our system versus yours. It's a co-owned network common infrastructure that we all use. Through that, we gain visibility to the people that we serve. And the people we serve can then redeem their assistance in a more convenient manner. For example, in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, um, our beneficiary, WFP beneficiaries and UNICEF beneficiaries can redeem their assistance from the same place in a single transaction, whereas before it was three transactions in three separate, let's say, desks. So just to show an element of how we can create this um, harmony and also simplify the, uh, the lives of the people that we are serving. And of course, then this leads to fairer outcomes. So instead of just because we have, don't have the data, some groups get more and some groups get less, even though that might, no, that's not their needs, now it's a bit more equitable, a bit more equal, let's say, um, distribution. So, uh, looking at the results, uh, we started our project in January of 2017 in uh, Pakistan for a small proof of concept. And we've now worked in Bangladesh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Ukraine as of last year. We're serving 4 million people every month. We've conducted 23 million transactions. Uh, we've transferred $550 million worth of so-called cash-based transfers I was referring to earlier. The United Nations uh, Population Fund, the United Nations Children Fund, and United Nations Women have additionally used our system to distribute sexual reproductive health items, hygiene items, and cash to their people. And uh, in Ukraine, uh, what I was saying before, there are more than 40 organizations giving cash to the same people. And there was no common visibility before. We went, we deployed the system there in May 2022. And so far, we've prevented more than $100 million worth of what we call unintended assistance overlap or therefore duplication. This is money that can now, and the resources are short, no matter how much we still can serve everyone. So then that money can now get channeled uh, to people uh, who didn't get any assistance or got less assistance, therefore making the... Um, making the whole process a little bit more equitable. We had done something similar in Lebanon in response to the Beirut blast, which again, a lot of people came together and we coordinated. And um, what, uh, what our hope is, is to, through this common network and joint ownership, uh, expand our work even further. Our system is available to all United Nations and international NGOs for free 
who have a demonstrated history of do no harm be, uh, on our uh, chain by default, I mean by its governance, we store no names, no biometrics, no dates of birth. Still though, it's beneficiary information, so we have to be sure that people who have access to that at least don't intend to abuse it. Um, we, and we have synergistic investments in the systems. Our smart contracts are available for free to all members, so anyone who joins can use our value transfer smart contract as is. They can modify it, they can deploy a new one. Or, as we know, there are other use cases which have also been talked about in this, use, uh, in this conference, such as digital ID. If you think about refugees, uh, which we've worked uh, with, have worked with in Jordan and Bangladesh, I read a statistic that on average, a refugee remains a refugee for 15 years. Imagine that. So during that, uh, well, you might, you know, first, a lot of refugees arrive without documentation. For example, the Rohingya refugees. Uh, you get documentation, you might get educated, you might get married, you might get uh, vaccinated. And all of this information stays behind in the various disparate systems of all the organizations that assisted you. Now, if you go, uh, you're settled into a third country or if you go back home, a lot of this information stays behind. So we've heard of digital ID on blockchain a few times. Imagine all of this information was amalgamated in one place. You could take it with you and you can make continued use of it. Um, not from a technological pr perspective, but from, as a humanitarian community, we're not yet there as an understanding. My hope is that through the other use case we're doing on coordination, we uh, instill the understanding, the comfort, the knowledge around blockchain and how it works, tokenization, as a step, hopefully, to get us to other use cases, such as digital ID. But point being, other organizations, given that we have the fundamental network, we have the operating system, we is set up and ready to support those uh, other use cases. So um, this is a photo from that Pakistan January 2017 proof of concept. This is a Hindu population just over the border in the Umarkot village in Pakistan that we supported. And one of the key things we've done is that the, the technology was, you know, has been kind of considered for the first world. You assume people have smartphones, you assume people have connectivity, you assume people have the digital literacy to understand private keys and how to manage them. We can't assume any of this. So, for example, for our assistance to be accessed, the person accessing it doesn't need any device at all or connectivity. We have them ready at the point of distribution. Uh, we have a custodian model for private key management, so each organization has the private keys for their assistance. My personal ideal is that that private key is eventually um, owned by the end person, the beneficiary, but we need to wait for smartphones and connectivity for that to happen. We have designed our system to be ready for that, so if and once they have it, we won't share the private key with them. They will generate their own key, private key and we will transfer ownership to them so that we don't even have their keys, in particular for more sensitive use cases such as um, digital identity. Um, yeah, so there are other, let's say, uh, constraints that we definitely work in, but I just wanted to add that, you know, people think, ah, like, you know, well, you have refugees, why don't you just send them some Bitcoin? Assuming you know who they are, they have wallets, they have this and, you know, uh, they, they know how to use it, but more importantly that, Bitcoin is accepted, for example, in a place like uh, Bangladesh or Yemen, which is not really the case. With that, I'll stop. We have just a few minutes in case there might be one or two questions. Please. Have you started porting over to BSD yet? Already on it. <laughs> I think 5 p.m. today is the launch. <laughs> Yes. Where, where, where are they? I see. Oh, thank you. Ma, ma, ma. The uh, World Bank IMF. So they're the United Nations bank, so to speak. So where are they at with this? By the way, congratulations. It's thank marvelous. You. Thank you so much. You're welcome. By the way, we're a small team of three. So Say again? Uh, by the way, thank you. And I take that on behalf of the team, which as a core team, we're three people in total. So, um, you know, we try to punch above our weight. So uh, within the UN and the whole community, there are different organizations with different views. We, as the World Food Program, were uh, born as the emergency food arm. So within 24, 48 hours, earthquake, war, whatever, we're there. 
There are longer term organizations, for example, our sister organization, Food and the Agriculture Organization, has a bit of a longer term view in terms of policy and uh, those kind of things. So the World Bank and IMF definitely fall a little bit more on the long term policy, uh, sort of that kind of a thing. The World Bank in particular, has been quite active and has a blockchain lab. And in particular, they're looking at digital ID standards. I think they have an initiative called ID4D. So again, it's a lot more theory, a lot more um, high level thinking, in particular at the governmental level, whereas we're a little bit more bottom up practical on the ground. And there's always an opportunity to marry the two. So we can try out theory in practice, give feedback and learn uh, from each other. Yeah. One more, and then I'll step off, or I can step off now. But oh, there's one there. Hi, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the governance model of the organization and a business model? How do you collaborate between the different organizations, and what is the business aspect of that? Thanks. Uh, so, as humanitarian organizations, there is there's no profit motive here. Uh, what we have to do is cover our costs. Um, as the World Food Program, when this uh, started, we had some generous donations from, for example, Germany, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium, the Australia, and that helped us get going with the innovation situation. But the governance is very interesting because uh, in a lot of blockchain, let's say, uh, collaboration efforts, you have consortiums. And the incentives for those are financial and or legal, so for you to essentially, quote unquote, behave. In the humanitarian world, we can't really rely on those uh, because, well, you know, the, the, you can't really have like financial staking of sorts. And also the legal jurisdiction can be a bit challenging because UN has privileges and immunities, others don't. Nonetheless, uh, we have designed a governance framework, as we call it. This is about the core blockchain network, not the use cases on it which delineates some things as such as membership criteria, so who can be members, uh, how to onboard and offboard people, how to maintain and operate the network, how data protection and privacy works, how dispute resolution works. And everyone has to agree to this, along with other things such as never storing names, birth dates, or uh, let's say biometrics on chain. Uh, or minimum commi technical commitments such as how to, uh, which type of node operate, uh, to operate and how. And everyone needs to abide by this. And when people want to deploy use cases, we evaluated one, technically it won't crash the network, and two, conceptually it won't harm the people we serve, but otherwise we're pretty hands-free about who can do what on the network. So this is the way that, you know, and this is as much a social experiment as it is a technological one. As I said, a lot of the um, foundation for why we use blockchain is to overcome politics and ownership issues and to see whether within a non-financial, uh, financially motivated governance model can we uh, build on our humanitarian imperative and try to make this work as a collective who competes and works together in a sort of a co-opetition uh, scenario, if that makes sense. All right, well, I'm happy to take less time. So we have one minute and about 30 seconds left. With that, thank you very much.